trainer, supervisor and therapist here in London. And I'm going to carry on with the series I've been working on, the Denton skill set. And here we go. Let me change this to speak of you. Okay. Hi, Andrea. If you could turn your video off. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay, brilliant. So, um, today I want to talk, carry on from where we stopped last time. Last time we were talking about, what were we talking about? If I remember correctly, we got as far as the skill set, um, placing emotions into the relational cycle. And today we're going to be talking about enactments. I also hope we get to managing the couple's responses. And I just want to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about enactments, and then I will invite your contributions because enactments are the third move of the tango. The first move, as we know, is present process. The second move is affect, assembly, and deepening. And the third move is enactments, setting up engaged encounters. And this is the crux of our work. Couples don't come just to talk to us. They come to learn to talk to each other, to feel safe enough to be open and responsive to each other. That's why they come. And that's why enactments are so important because if we're not doing enactments, if we're not doing enactments, then the couples don't get to have these moments, experience these moments of deep connection in, in the session that begin to calm the nervous system, that begin to soothe and comfort each other so that they begin to feel safe enough to do it out of session. So we miss a trick when we don't set up enactments. So it's important to know what it is and how to do it, how to set up successful enactments and in life, nothing is perfect things will go wrong, how to handle it. And I don't even want to use the word going wrong because it's not going wrong, it's information, it's data. So it's very much about how we set it up, how the different kinds of enactments we can set up, how to manage it going sort of not the way we intend. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to um, share my screen, hang on a minute. and go here so like i said can you see my screen can anybody give me a yay yes okay great okay so today we're going to hopefully do two, the two more skills skill eight therapeutic use of enactments and skill nine managing defensive responses and i really want to start here okay and slideshow from current slide. Okay, so, and I wanna pin this, hang on a minute, just a moment. Pin, show video panel, okay, great. So, enactments, what are they? Enactments sounds so simple and obvious in a way. It's just that moment where we help couples go from talking to us to directly sharing with each other something that's meaningful, something about their own emotional experience or their needs directly with each other. And it sounds really straightforward. All we want to do is go from accessing emotions, having accessed it, distill the key core emotion, or accessing a person assembling some of their affect, linking two things together, for instance, linking a trigger and an action tendency, getting something that an element of emotion, organizing it a bit, and then helping the clients pass it directly to each other rather than us being translators. We wanna be choreographers helping couples share directly with each other. So I think we all know, probably if you've attended any EFT training or read a little bit about EFT, you probably already know this is what enactments is. It's the crux of the work we do because Couples, when, they, when we first meet someone, we're feeling safe and connected. We all feel quite open. We bear our souls. 
But as we begin to have these negative cycles and lose our sense of connection with each other, what happens is it becomes overseas to open up and share our inner world with our partner. And enactments is a way to bring couples back into that space to have our whole goal is not to solve their problems, is to have safe ARE conversations. A standing for accessible, B, R standing for responsive, and E for engaged. Now, the healing is in the conversation. We're not gonna be able to solve any of their problems. I even say that to them, you know, I'm gonna help you be able to talk about it in a way that doesn't alienate you from each other, but I can't actually help you solve any of our problems. If this is the goal, then how do we go about it? We learn best when we feel good. So we want the experience of doing an enactment to be successful. In other words, last week, Sandra was talking about slicing it thinner. We want to slice it thin enough that couples have an experience, successful experience of sharing. And when we say successful, what we mean is that they don't have an aversive experience from sharing. Meaning if their partner does not respond well, we're there to actually put our arms around them both and hold them both and create that safety that it, that's missing between them. So here we go. Our goal is to improve the security of that bond. That's why we have to do it. If we're not doing it, we're not giving couples this experience of having ARE connections, which is the healing, right? Now, what we're trying to do is, it's not imago therapy in that sense, because we're picking something, it's very naturalistic because we're picking something, we're constantly listening for what's going on between the couple. And we're constantly looking for something that's meaningful, an emotional piece that's meaningful to drop into, expand, and then pass. We're trying to build that bridge from what's happening within to a connection to the other person by sharing. So how do we go about this? Oh, by the way, this is quite important. I think I should go back. We're not trying to teach communication skills. It's a heart to heart conversation. It's coming from the heart. It's not problem solving. It's not negotiating. Yeah. Now this is the key thing because it's, I, I think it sounds pretty simple. Can you turn to your partner and share? Can you turn your partner and let her know about this? Can you help her understand this? But my main thing has always been what to enact. It's not that I don't want to enact it. It's not that it doesn't sound straightforward, but my main thing is what do I enact, right? So I hope to spend a little, a few minutes here actually talking about the different kinds of enactments we could do because that helps you begin to think about, oh, do I do that? Maybe I could be trying that out. The first one is diagnostic. We want to be doing enactments from the get-go. Right? We don't want to wait to stage two. We don't want to wait until there's perfect safety. We want to be doing enactments from the get-go. So the first kind of enactment you do is the introductory one, where as people are talking to you, you ask them things like, you check in. Have you told her that? Does she know about that? Ah, right. So now might be a good time to tell her again. Can you tell her directly about this? Let's say um, the person says I'm here because I really want to um, this relationship matters to me I really want to get things right and I feel like I'm getting it wrong now this is just the initial session maybe where you're asking people um, what's brought you here you know what what why are you coming to what's brought you to therapy at this point in time now that might sound very sort of casual um, you know I'm here because I really want to make it work but that's really powerful you never know how much energy it took to get people to come to therapy, how much courage, how long time has passed. So to hear your partner say, oh, I'm here because I really want to make it work is important to me, this relationship matters. Right there and then pausing and saying, wow, that sounds really important. Do you, have you told her that? Does she know about that? No, can you tell her directly? That's a kind of diagnostic. It's really from the get-go. You're trying to check, are people going to follow? Are they flexible enough? Are they responsive enough? Are they ready? Are they too rigid? 
it just gives you a sense of the relationship, the relationship in action. So diagnostic enactments are really a chance for you to feel the waters and see if couples, you know, some couples will say no, and then you will know right away, okay, I'm going to have to go gentle with enactments here. I'm going to have to build, go softly, softly. So that it just gives you data. It's just like an experiment. You're just trying to try it out. Now, another one is positive enactments. And positive enactments could even fall in under heightening rarely occurring responses. But also when I say positive, I don't just mean somebody paying compliments to their partner saying positive things. I mean it when people are really telling their truth. I think a lot of the enactments I do in stage one are very much heightening rarely occurring responses or just what I call positive enactments. And I want to give you some practical examples because this is a practice group, right? So whenever somebody states their attachment intention, like the example I gave before, I want to make this work, this relationship matters to me. That to me is an opportunity for what I would call a positive enactment or just a rarely occurring response, right? And I'll get them, you know, do, can you tell her, can you look at her and share that? That feels really important, right? Now, another thing is when I reframe couples' behaviors or their intentions, right? Somebody's complaining and I'm reframing that complaint into, oh, let's say we never spend time together. That sounds like a complaint. But actually what they're really saying is I want us to spend more time together. So I'm now reframing their complaint into a need or a desire or a longing or a wish. When I reframe it that way, so I'm really hearing you say, you want to spend more time together. Am I getting it? The person says, yes. Right. They've accepted my reframe of their behavior. They've accepted my reframe of their attachment intention. Once they accept my reframe, I get them to share it. So can you tell her, I really want to be able to spend more time together. Now, you're still not in stage two. You're not asking from a very vulnerable place but it's a positive intent and I've grabbed hold of it and I have reframed the behavior, I've reframed something, they've accepted it and I get them to pass it. It's far more meaningful if they pass it than if I do. Other things I will, I, that I classify under these sort of rarely recurring responses of positive enactments are when people acknowledge the impact of their behavior or they acknowledge their partner's experience. So if somebody says something like, I can see she's hurt, or I can see she's sad, they're seeing their partner in that moment, right? They're actually seeing where the partner is, they're seeing their partner's experience. Again, that's the thing I will grab hold on. I don't even need to deepen it particularly. I would just say, wow, you can really see she's hurting here. You can see she's sad. Yeah, and what happens for you when you see that? Oh, it saddens me too. Ah, oh, can you tell her? Can you help her in your own words? Can you tell her directly? I see that you're sad and it saddens me. Now, this is not something I've deepened too much, but it's a positive, what I would call a positive moment and rarely, a rarely occurring incident that I really just want to grab hold of whenever people express appreciation, whenever people affirm their partner, whenever people try to reassure their partner, I want her to feel safe. I don't want her to be afraid of me. That, for instance, I'll grab hold of. That's a reassurance. Whenever people say what, some kind of admission of their behavior and the impact, when express some kind of regret, remorse, when they admit to something they do that their partner has been protesting about, they admitting it to me, I will get them to turn and pass. Can you tell her directly? That feels so important that you can own this, right? That you're aware that actually, you know, when you leave the room or when you raise your voice, that's very unsettling for her. Can you tell her directly? Now, these are just moments of connection that I'm grabbing onto but it doesn't become an enactment. It doesn't become a meaningful encounter unless I get them to turn and share. So my ears are primed to listen for things like that. Whenever people say something that I feel is a bid for connection, whenever people assert themselves, like 
I know I make mistakes. I can't get it right all the time. I don't actually really particularly care where we are in the process. I will just slow it down, reflect it, repeat it, stay with it a little bit, moment a little bit, and then ask them to pass directly. And then I will process the enactment because these moments when people own their personal truths, when they own their personal struggles, when they make some kind of bid for connection, when they make some kind of assertion or boundary statement, these are those moments that I want to grow. And these are the moments I will get partners to enact. Now, another key one is present position enactments. Why do couples come to us? Couples come to us because they're struggling. They're struggling because to love somebody is to become vulnerable. To allow somebody to matter to you is to become vulnerable. It's one of the most vulnerable things we can do is to allow somebody else to matter. And that means that to the extent that someone matters to you, they can trigger your vulnerability. And what happens between couples is they, and I include myself, is we struggle to express the vulnerability. Rather, what the partner sees is how you protect your vulnerability, how you defend your vulnerability, how you avoid it, how you how you avoid your pain, basically. They don't see the vulnerability. And when we talk about present position in, enact, uh, in EFT, we're talking about the position people take to avoid, to defend, to protect their vulnerability. So present position enactments are when we help people, we process with people what triggers their vulnerability, the actual vulnerability, and what they do with it. So it might be something like when somebody said, when you you finally got into a point where somebody's able to say, yes, you know, when I feel like I'm getting it wrong, you know, I just get so overwhelmed, I don't know what to do, and I shut down. Right, so you track that a little bit, stay with that a little bit. The overwhelm is the vulnerability, the shutdown is the position, is how they cope. So we link these two elements, the trigger, for instance, or the vulnerability and the action tendency. It's so empowering for couples to become consciously aware of what they do with a vulnerability. Because remember, it's a, it's a learned strategy. It's overlearned. You don't even think, you do it, right? You cope, you just protect yourself. So when we slow it down enough that people can begin to, it become, become, they become aware of it as much as their partner becomes aware of it but to own it, to actually get them to turn and share, you know, when I do so and so, so you can reverse it. You can either go from action tendency and link to vulnerability, or you can go from vulnerability and link to action tendency. The important thing is to link the two because what your partner experiences is often not your vulnerability, it's your action tendency. So they have to hear you own both in order to be able to take it in. And the fourth, um, enactment is actually whenever we get new new emotional experiences we want to just turn it from the impersonal which is your own personal emotional experience into the relational into the sharing it happens a lot in stage two when we get people to share their deepest fears and we get people to share their needs this happens a lot in stage two but as we're saying it can happen all the way through so I've just talked through this I'm gonna talk through this and then I want us to do this together because this is a practice group. We wanna to learn together. I wanna to talk to you about what are the common mistakes? What are the problems you encounter? And hopefully if I don't have the answers, I have a whole team of you out here ready to help me. So the first thing is setting the stage. Please do not throw people in the deep end. I've been in couple therapy. I know how hard it is to share your heart with someone you no longer feel completely safe with. So don't throw them in the deep end, set the stage. Do you think she knows this? What would it be like to tell her this? Can you imagine turning to her and saying this? You're basically checking, you're making them aware that something is about to happen. You're setting the stage for a meaningful contact between them before you actually ask them to share. The second phase is you actually get them to turn to each other and share. And then of course you process the encounter. And I think a key thing to know about processing the encounter, which is the fourth move of the tango. The, uh, the second phase here is the, second, is the third move of the tango where you get to ask them to turn. 
But the third move is where you process the encounter because this is where the work actually starts. This is what has been challenging for them to do is to manage each other's responses. So we really want to check in with both parties and make sure that we get how they're impacted by what has just been said. And if we're in stage one, we want to then process the blocks to hearing, to seeing, to understanding. And if we're in stage two of EFT, we're more like leaning towards acceptance. We're acknowledging the, we're say, we're acknowledging the but, but we're leaning more into the yes. In stage one, we acknowledge the yes. If there is a yes, there might not even be a yes, but we're working with the but. What's the block? What gets in the way? What are you hearing? What did you just hear? What happened inside you when you heard blah, blah, blah? Right, what else do I want to say? I have different tricks for setting up enactments, but before I do that, I think I want to hear from you. Helena, so, yeah? quick question. Um, people are asking about the slides um, uh -huh. and are saying that they don't think they have them. So we can just say that we'll send them after this, yes? Yes, I don't know if you guys have noticed that I am very um, back to front, yes. If I was very organized, you'd have had the slides beforehand, but you get the slides afterwards, yeah? When, when we send the next, because next week, Sarah is going to be doing the reading group. So when we send the email reminder, you'll get the slide for this enactments, yeah? So before I go anywhere else, before I tell you the tricks of the trade that I use, I just want to hear from you. What are the challenges you have with setting up enactments? What are the common problems you run into? What do you find hard about it? What do you find good about it? And by the way, if you don't want, if you don't feel like showing your face, but you want to say something, or you have never said something, please join in. You don't have to use your camera. You can just unmute yourself. But I really love for everyone to feel like they can take part. Sally. Something that I hear a lot as I'm trying to set up an enactment yes. is that one partner will turn to the other and say, but I said this to them already. Why do I need to say it again? Thank you, <laughs> Sally. <laughs> Yeah, that's the first roadblock we run into <laughs> typically, isn't it? The first roadblock is, but I've just said it. Yeah. And I think the most obvious thing you hear in EFT is just say to them something like, yes, I know you've just told me, but it's a completely different experience when you turn and tell her and, you know, you look at her directly and share, you know, I can guarantee it's going to be feel completely different telling her directly or him directly than telling me. That's the standard response, right? You've probably yeah. heard that before, haven't you? <laughs> yes. And yeah. that works in, you know, sometimes and, and sometimes, you know, that's met re with resistance at, during stage one, definitely. Well, you know, the, the, the misbelief that it could be different. Yes. So that's, um, so that's the first obvious thing is, that what I just shared is the first obvious thing you try to do is just say, yeah, you know, feel different. The other thing though I found, and it is true, if someone has just told you, they do feel like their partner's just heard it, right? And their partner has just heard it. Yeah. But you could just check in with their partner. The next thing you could do is, you know, have you heard it before? Have you, it, it, have you heard it before like this? Have you heard it before like this? The partner will just say, no, not like this. Mm -hmm. Then you can say, ah, right. So you're hearing something a little bit different here. Mm. Right. So now you're eliciting the partner's support because usually they have not shared it quite like that. Mm. So that's one thing you could elicit the partner's support. Right. So could, so actually I'm hearing that of course you've said this before but there's something different about this could mm. you tell her directly that's another way to go about it elicit the partner's response the, the amount of times the partner says I haven't heard it quite like this that's great right but the other thing we can do is how we set up the enactment <clears throat> how we ask so if it feels like a repetition 
I don't blame people for resisting, mm. right? Sometimes you can just slice it thinner. You might even just say, can you look at her? You don't have to say anything. Can you just look at her? Mm. And even in that moment of contact, something will happen. What do you see as you look in her face? Mm. And actually what happens is they see, they come into the present moment and they see a different expression mm. on their partner's face. That's different from what happens in the cycle at home. Yeah, yes. But that's again what Sandra was talking about last week, slicing it thinner. Like, can you just look at her? You don't have to say a word. Can you just look at her or him? Yeah, they will see something different. But that's just one aspect of what you can do. That's just slicing it thinner. The other thing, and I think I've been playing around with enactments for a while, and what I've realized is I have to make it feel slightly different. Mm. So what I, I would typically do is I will listen to what they've just said. I've decided that actually I'm moved by it in some way. It's landed somewhere inside my bloodstream and I'm feeling something that this could be meaningful to enact because of the attachment undertones in it, the emotional weight of it. But rather than just say, can you turn and tell her and just in your own words, that's just too general. Mm. And it sounds as if you're repeating. I will pick on something specific and say, wow. Ah, when, when, he, when, he, when he or she leaves or when she or he leaves the room, you feel like you don't matter enough right? He sends you the message that you're not important enough that he or she would stay and engage and talk with you. Yeah. Could you help, could you turn and look at her or him and just share, help her understand a little bit more about that sense of I'm not important enough that you would stay with me. Mm. So I've zoomed in on a particular emotional piece or attachment piece and I'm saying, can you help her or him understand a little bit more about this piece? Mm. In other words, they're going to repeat practically what they've just said. But the way it's phrased is as if something new is value added. I'm adding value. I'm saying add a bit to this piece. Value added, right? I'm not just saying, can you tell her that? I'm not just, because the other thing we do is we often reflect back what they said and then say, can you tell him or her? And then it feels like I've said it, you said it, and now you want <laughs> me to say it again? Really, this is getting tedious, right? <laughs> so the key thing is ref pick a, reflect a particular piece and then ask them to expand it. Can you help her? That feels so important. Mm. Can you tell him a little bit more about this? Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, can you turn and tell directly? So does that help a little bit, Sam? Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Helena. Just really sort of slowing down as you say slicing it thin and zooming mm. in on a piece that is new yes yeah that is new it's about the expansion you're saying yes I, I like to think of it as you know that our target is emotion right mm. but we're not just targeting emotion remember we're always trying to create a corrective emotional experience yeah in other words we're trying to add something that was missing safety mm. security responsiveness connection that's yeah. the value added and so you're targeting something and you're adding value by saying can you expand this mm. can you say a little bit more about this in that in that way they become more accessible they're sharing more and they don't feel like they're repeating so that's my main trick is thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you sally any other comments please join me don't leave me here on the lonesome on does anybody want to ask or comment and do you want to share your trick hazel my trick is uh, in the beginning of the session you know the first session yes i will grab that moment of when there is a positive thing mm -hmm. but yes. i do see that they don't understand when i say would you kindly let your partner know what you've just said and uh, like face him or her mm -hmm. and they will they will say i've already said it mm -hmm. and even if they say it i know it hasn't you know like they haven't got it yeah they, you know it but i'm all i say to myself is at least i'm seeding it 
for the mm. next, you know, like future. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So yeah. what you're saying there is so important, Hazel, because there is really no failure in that sense because something has been shared. If nothing mm. else, they've turned, they've shared something. Yeah. Even if it wasn't exactly what you had in mind. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm. And actually what you're reminding me of there, Hazel, thank you very much, is when you set up an enactment, you have to pick a slice and repeat that slice. If not, if you make it too general, they will go all over the place. Mm. That's key, right? We know what we want them to share. We know that positive bit. They exactly. don't even probably register it. No. No. So we have to point to that piece. All right. Right? You have to know the piece and you have to name it. If not, they will go all over the place. And I often think of enactments in this way. It's like, I feel like I'm a parent putting my arms around you and saying, here, I'm going to hold you in this space to talk about this. I have to focus you in because if not, you're just going to run all over the place. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. thank you, Hazel. That was really helpful. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Richard. So what I do is sometimes when it's a very cognitive that they're saying that I kind of just model that oh I'm, I'm just needing i'm just feeling into what you're saying so i kind of model that i'm feeling it in my body mm, nice uh, sort of like so what's mm. that like what does that feel like for you so just slow the whole tempo down mm. this idea of head talk and heart talk and yes okay you're feeling that could you now turn and yes stare it from your body yeah. wonderful what you're talking about there is the new when we're heightening emotional experiences, right? Because positive enactments don't particularly have to be deep. They just have to be meaningfully loaded. But what you're talking about is, especially as we go deeper, we want to get to level four. And one of the ways you're doing it is by feeling into your own body. It's like you're feeling along with them. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that's yeah. I just need a moment to feel into what you're saying. And then I kind of... Yeah. Oh, that, that sounds really important. I just slow that that is so nice and you're using yourself as well right like let me feel into that it's an implicit invitation to join me in feeling into that as well right <laughs> so i really like that and it's so it's so overt thank you that's great and did i see deborah for a moment yes deborah i can't hear you yet hi hi deborah uh, Helena, what's really staying with me, um, I wrote mm -hmm. it down what you said, um, and it was around reframing the complaint into a need, longing or wish. Yes. And, um, and I, it, it just really sort of impacted on me and, and, oh. and, and how you then went on to uh, give an example of that. Mm. Um, your, your whole emotional state as you reflected that back to the couple in your example mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. actually reflected your perception of the need, longing or wish mm. which you dragged my nervous system <laughs> into, into yeah. that state that you were uh, conveying. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, I can imagine that that's really powerful for a oh, couple. Thank you so much because I really think you're so right, Deborah, and it really refers to what Richard was saying a moment ago. We are the instrument, right? And I just really want to feel into that moment. But what I loved is that Richard made it overt that he was doing that. And I think that really is an implicit invitation. Join me in feeling into this. That's how I understood it. By the way, Richard, I'm going to be stealing that from the moment from now on. I'm going to just really like, because I do it implicitly. I, I let myself feel it. But to really say that is inviting them to feel it with you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and then it communicates something because you're taking them, the nervous system to nervous system, right? Yes, lovely. Thank you. And Sarah's joining us. And um, Isabel is joining us. On behalf of Andrea on the chat. Um, oh, Andrea you're going to be? Yeah. Okay. Andrea says uh, she's seen couples online when partners are in different places on different mm -hmm. screens. And 
often they don't want to enact because they feel like they're already doing it on screen. So she's saying any tips for online? Yes, I will do that. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, Sarah. A fly just flew by, sorry. Okay. On the screen, I think the important thing is to understand what enact means. Speak, can you speak to John or can you speak to Isabel? Can you talk to Isabel about? Oh, Isabel, don't go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, can you speak to Isabel? Can you talk to Isabel about this piece? The enacting is that it's not a telling, it's not a report, it's a speaking to and direct. So even if they're in different places, in that moment, you're communicating, it's not me you're speaking to, it's Isabel you're speaking to. And I, that, whether you're in, I mean, because I'm having the same thing as well, people in different places, trapped in different places because of the, shut, uh, the lockdown. It's the act of not telling but speaking to, directly to someone, that is the key thing. So I would say, as long as you make it explicit, can you speak to, or can you talk to, or can you help John understand? Can you help Mary understand? And as soon as you notice that they're slipping back into a report or a telling, redirect them. Can you, tell, can you talk to John? Can you talk to Richard? Can you talk to Isabel? So I hope that helps a bit. That's the, that's the main way I do it. I'm very acutely aware of the difference between telling and talking to or speaking directly to. And you make that explicit. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I hope that helps. Andrea, do you want to add something to it? Maybe that was, maybe you have a slightly different, um, you can unmute yourself if you want to add to it. Is it Andrea that asked that question? Yes, 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 thank you very much. Yes, it's, I guess it's just that the, the, um, the resistance that I often experience from couples mm -hmm. seems like it's on another level when it comes to online in that situation, mm -hmm. um, that, it, that it feels as if they, mm -hmm. it's, it's not just that they don't see the point in it, but they, they are, um, it's like there's, there's, an, there's a high level of of emotion so where they are quite d defensive about it and really resist it mm -hmm. as if I'm putting them in a position that makes them feel really uncomfortable doing it so that's yeah that's my challenge ah and you know I love what you just did there Andrea can you imagine mirroring that back to them I'm really aware that we're on screen and it's really exposing and of course you feel really vulnerable you know having to share like this and you sort of your eyeballs are on each other so to speak could you imagine just feeding that back to them and acknowledging it? Because you see it so clearly from the way you just shared it now. Yes, actually, that's really helpful, Helena. Some, I guess it's in a way it's making me, I can tell it triggers me, you know, it makes me defensive about it. Mm. Whereas actually what you're saying is just to make it explicit, yes, and to, to mm. give, um, to bring it into the room, as it were, on yeah. screen and to, um, and to work with, with it in more depth as to what that's really about. Yes, that's the present process. If yeah. people are uncomfortable with doing it, that's your present process. That's what you need to work with and bring into the room. That's what present process is. Present process is what's most alive. And what's most alive is it that feels uncomfortable. And you just described it beautifully, which is what present process is. So you just feed it back to them and then you check in. What's it like to hear me say this? You know, am I getting it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And once you process it, you dissolve it. Yes, I suppose that somehow with being online, I didn't feel that, I suppose it's my own discomfort with online. I could totally see where they were coming from with it. But, yeah. but it's, it's um, yeah, there's another level to it, isn't there, in terms of understanding mm. how that fits into their relationship, which I guess maybe I haven't always gone to. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, that's really helpful, actually, because it reminds us to really use ourselves as the instrument and what we are seeing. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrea. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can, I, can I go ask a challenge? Um, so what I find is I'm exploring with one of uh, one of the couple about mm -hmm. kind of what their kind of uh, what's you know what the reactive emotion and the feeling underneath and mm -hmm. and, and then set up the enactments. But often there's a tinge of kind of blame when they you know when they share it across. 
So mm. my understanding is it's meant to be a completely like transparent, this is me, I'm showing you me. This is what mm -hmm. goes on inside me and this is what I end up doing in a sort of a yes. general connected encounter. But sometimes it's tinged, you know, sometimes they, it, it sounds like a bit of an attack. Right. So there might be a bullet intent, uh, implant, implanted there. Yeah, and delivery. So, yeah, I'll be, I'd love to know how you respond to that. Great. So what do you do? Let me, somebody actually told me to repeat the questions people ask because then everybody hears it again. So I, I'm, I, you were very clear, Richard. I'm just repeating it for that purpose. Okay. So Richard is saying when you ask, you think you've actually made it so clear, the signal is really clear. This is what I feel. This is what I do. And you get them to share. And when they turn to share, they sneak in a little blame in there. Right? That's what you're saying. How do you hold that? Would you call it an outright bullet? Because dealing with an outright bullet is different from dealing with a blame. Just that it's no, it's not an obvious blame. It's just, it's just not totally owned. It's not kind of this, it's, the way mm -hmm. I'd say it, rather than saying, I want you to see my vulnerability, I want you to see, and I'm, I'm just being really open, and mm -hmm. I'm doing what I do, I end up doing this. Mm -hmm. It comes across as, I'm really hurting, and then I get angry with you. And it, um, it has that sort of, it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like, it doesn't have the vulnerability factor to yes. To, to cause the connection yeah that's actually much more helpful Isabel I've got you got Tony there yeah okay great so I really like that that's another distinction when the person turns the vulnerability is not so apparent anymore right so there are two possibilities there Richard either you you didn't fully access the vulnerability and remember, when you're trying to do a present position uh, enactment, you want to have got to the vulnerability, you want to have done some kind of level three, four, and then linked it to the action tendency. So I would say, have you really touched? Because the first thing that's helpful to do is to get the trigger and the action tendency. When I hear this, when I get the message I'm feeling, I get angry. And that's when I shout at you. That's the first level. That's step two of EFT, linking trigger and action tendency. Unless people know what they do, they're not ready to go to the, you're not, that you're not quite ready to dig around in the emotion underneath it. So first of all, think, have I done that sort of linking between cue and action tendency? And then I want to go on there to the vulnerability. Have I really done that unacknowledged step three, unacknowledged primary emotion? Because once you've done it, and access vulnerability, you then link back to what you've already done. Right, of course. I totally get it when I really feel like no matter what I do, I'm gonna get it wrong. I'm failing you. I just feel like there's something just like, it's hopeless. I'll never get it right. I'm just, there's something, there's something so deficient, unacceptable about me. Yeah, no wonder you then shut down. Yeah, that makes so much sense, right? So, in some ways, I've, I've, it just occurred to me you have a very sort of lovely way of really validating, you know, in your soft talk. And so you end up, and it sounds like it makes perfect sense that you just walk out the door and mm. totally blank your partner. So, yeah, so, so the, way, the way you phrase it, you kind of like give them like a big pass, like kind of like, of course, that really makes sense. So yeah. I end up just walking out for two hours. <laughs> yeah. And then and then I would hook you in because you you feel held in that vulnerability. And then I say, can you tell her, you know, I know that I walk out, but actually underneath, I'm just feeling just so helpless, like I'll never get it right by you. So I would say the first stage is help people link their trigger and their action tendency and then go underneath because then you can get the vulnerability and then validate it by linking it to the action tendency, right? But you have done that piece of work. They already know they walk out, but now you've helped them feel the vulnerability underneath. So I would say one part is have you got enough of the vulnerability before you set up that kind of present position enactment? The next thing I would say is when 
And, and this happens to me all the time. I set up the enactment and then I forgot what enactment I set up. <laughs> it's true. I I, then I don't, they start to talk and I'm like, oh, oh, uh, what were we trying to say? Where are we actually? The next thing I would say is, and I joke with my couples, I say, let's say I'm, I hope you guys don't mind being husband and wife for two seconds. Isabel has gone again. Where is Isabel? <laughs> but okay, let's imagine that Isabel was sitting here with Richard. I, and, is, and, and in setting up the enactment, Isabel began to talk in a blaming sort of way about Richard. I would say, Isabel, you know what's happening here. You're beginning to tell Richard about Richard. And I just want to stay with you and what goes on for you. So my phrase is, you've started to tell Richard about Richard. You've started to tell Tony about Tony. You've started to, and that's my way of saying you've left your side of the tennis court and you're now talking about something else. So I would say when you set up an enactment, focus, remember whose experience are they in now? Are they reporting on their partner or are they in their own experience? And the minute they start telling Richard about Richard, I help them steer them back into their own experience. Gently, of course, but I steer them back. Isabel, you don't escape. Where are you? She's gone. I think, oh, her, I think her internet's playing up, Helena. Oh, she's back again. Oh, there she is. Yes, Isabel, do you have a comment or a challenge? I well, I, I kind of lost the track because there were so many things people were saying that I kept coming up with other sort of things. But uh -huh. there was just one line I've stolen from someone, and I'm really sorry i can't give credit to that person because i don't know who it was so just steal the credit it's fine it's not mine but, but it, it's sometimes when there's an act and they've said a lot mm -hmm. and thinking all those parts of the emotional process and mm -hmm. and you know your clients some even when they've said something simple and beautiful you know when you ask them to enact a whole volume is going to come out and their partner is going to lose track of the really important part of the message. Uh -huh. And I can't remember who it was, but it was, you know, reflecting back what they said. So it is reflected back. Good. Then, and then to be saying, what does your heart hmm. want her heart to hear? Or, oh, isn't that just lovely? Because it's, that's getting down to the attachment message and to the real mm -hmm. love of, you've said all this stuff to me, it's really important. What's actually important for you, to you that she or he is going to be able to take away from this? That is so lovely, you know, Isabel, because what you're doing there is distilling it. Because we said... Enactments are really heart-to-heart -heart conversations. And why not just be so explicit about it that what does your heart want her heart to hear? Mm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I hope everybody steals it and takes credit for themselves from now on. <laughs> I can't remember. So we, can all, we can all steal that one. That's really beautiful. What is the core? Because that's ultimately what we're trying to distill. What is the core hurt? What's the core pain? What's the core fear? Because that's what's hard to share. That's what couples, we all know how hard it is to be vulnerable with somebody you care deeply about when you're worried how that's going to affect the bond between you. So what does your heart want her heart to hear? Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Tony, did you want to add uh, something? Yes, if I can. You can hear me, can you? Very clearly. That's good because uh, last night I had an experience of the middle of uh, a session. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Let me just say something, Tony, just, just to make sure. You yeah. know this is going to go on the group, on the sure. internet. Yes, so when yes. you ask, make sure it's general. Think about the question or the general comment, not the case, uh, okay? Uh, All right. it is, it's nothing to do with the case. It's, okay. it's, it's the technology. Oh, okay. Um, and, 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 and suddenly it, it went a bit hazy and then uh, we were back, um, but they couldn't hear me. Okay. Um, and I've no idea what's caused that because that's, that's a, a different um, phasing out from before. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone's got any ideas about what I could do. What I did, in fact, I phoned them. Um, okay. the audience, um, I was sort of holding my phone and talking to them and I, I sort of almost wish I had turned off the screen because ah. I don't think I'm very good holding a phone like this and sort of concentrating on my phone to try and hear them. Um, yeah. 
see them. So, so sometimes the technology lets you down. Mm. The thing and difficult in terms of this transition, though, is the sort of the, the in the room. And in, in most cases, my couples are together. They've just got the one screen. They're sitting facing me, which yeah. is very different from how I do it in the room. I basically get them facing each other and I'm sort of I'm, I'm there. They can communicate with me, but I can sort of move back. Um, yes, I can do that in the room. I can sort of move back and to sort of encourage them to be close to one another. Um, mm -hmm. but the whole process of of turning to each other when you're having to sit quite close to to be on the screen to see me, um, yeah, a problem. Um, you know, the ideal might be if they both had a screen, but they, they often don't both have a screen anyway. Mm. Um, wondering if 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 you or others have got experience of of using this new mechanism as to you know, effectively what tricks do we, how do we need to alter the tricks we need to mm. engage with each other when when the trouble is the engagement is with the screens you've almost got to say don't look at the screen look at each other it, so a, can you imagine saying that to them tony because that's what i actually say to them i say don't look at right. me yeah. can you just look at each other for a moment because forget i'm here just can you look at each other that's yeah. ex as explicit as that, because that's basically, we don't want them in different rooms if we can help it, because we want those motor neurons firing off. So right. I will literally say, so you know what I'm going to ask you to do now? Can you just, st don't look at me, just turn to each other. And you know, they become like dogs that have been trained. When I, I mean, I mean that in a funny way, but I just mean like the minute I say, you know what I'm going to ask, the chairs, mm -hmm. they turn to each other. They've, and I say, forget I'm here. Right? Mm -hmm. So we make it, I think, well, I think the theme today is making it just really explicit what you want or what you want from them. Yeah. And the way you said it was perfect. You know, mm -hmm. just don't look at me. Don't look at the screen. Can you look at each other? Yeah, that's great. If I hadn't said it, I wouldn't have known how to say it. So that's what I... But you just said it. <laughs> uh, right. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thought about, isn't it? <laughs> yes, thank you so much. That's a good point, Tony. And thank now you. we've got Suzanne. Yeah, I just I just want to say that the conversation has been so useful because really you demystified these mm. enactments. Because the word enactment, it, to start with, terrified me. And <laughs> I think, how am I going to do this? Then there's the parts of the enactment. How am I going to do that? But actually, you've put it in such simple, practical terms for me today that it's oh. taken all that pressure off. So oh. I'm very, very grateful. And thank you so much. I'm going to try lots of different ways because that you don't have to follow this script it is just take yeah. the attachment behavior put it into something that may mm. lead to an enactment so yeah mm. that's brilliant oh thank you so much and now suzanne you reminded me of something that i wanted to say that uh, 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 and uh, i think it was two month uh, two sessions ago one of these groups deborah said she loved deborah mitchell said she loved the change from enactments to engaged encounters because that oh, yeah. felt so much more heartfelt and i do enactment does have this sort of <clears throat> about it right whereas an engaged encounter we are just trying to set up meaningful contact mm. so when somebody says something that's emotionally loaded we stay there long enough to get somewhere because if you stay okay guys this is my latest if you stay anywhere, and I mean anywhere, long enough, you will get somewhere deep enough. Mm. If you pick any part, any emotional piece and stay with that long enough, you will get somewhere deep enough. And you don't have to worry about which piece in particular. If you just pick a piece that has some kind of emotion in it, some kind of attachment significance in it, if you stay anywhere long enough you will get somewhere deep enough and then you just get them to turn and share and it's that's just that meaningful contact we want people to get talking to each other again yeah so the, the, the enactment thing, happens and that's them. it and yeah. that's it that's the encounter we're trying to set up an encounter we're trying to build a bridge between my inner world and your inner world now the the thing you've reminded me though of is an enactment is more like a chain reaction. It's not like, oh, you say this, then I check in with you. And by the way, I want to give a health warning about enactments. 
when you somebody shares something don't assume that their partner heard what you heard is it refers to what isabel just said a moment ago what does your heart want her heart to hear don't assume that their heart heard what their partner wanted them to hear mm -hmm. so i'm about to shift gears and go into what happens when it goes wrong but i wanted to find out before i do the the actual slide to see if there were more things because one is don't expect that it's going to go well. Don't expect that the partner is not hearing it through the filter of their negative cycle. Oh. Right? So I'm always blown away when someone says something like, I'm worth nothing to him. And their partner hears, I'll never be able to please you. It's like, I'm telling you that I'm worth nothing to you. And what you're hearing is, I'll never be able to please you. So don't assume that the message that was passed is the message that's received. So when we get a kind of reaction to what has been passed, we have to check in. What did you just hear? What did you hear her say? Oh. Right. And then when you hear what they said and it's not what their partner shared, you say, ah, no wonder you would react. Because actually what I heard was, I have no value to you. But what you heard was, I'm unacceptable to you. I will never be able to please you. Wow, you really did miss each other in this moment. Shall we go slow and look? Maybe this is part of what happens in your dance. Then you've moved it to a different level. The key health warning is don't expect that what's passed is what's received. Mm. Check it out. If you get a reaction, check it out. What did they actually receive? What is it that they heard? Yeah? And then I'll, I'll move to slides in a minute, but let me just check in. Thank you, Suzanne. That was lovely feedback. Thank you. Does anybody else have some kind of problem they're running to? Because before I present the slides, I always think this is a practice group. We want to use, you know, what you really encounter in the counseling room. And then maybe the slides will cover it or not cover it. Any other thing you run into? We've talked about different things so far. We've talked about, okay, what do you even enact? How do you enact it? um yeah like oh hazel welcome back i think my 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 problems with enactments sometimes they're a bit long <laughs> you know like a long sentence like, like a manuscript so, do you mean you yeah like yeah oh so i don't know whether others experience that i don't hazel, know this is wonderful you i had forgotten this you're trying to enact something edible, something yes. bite size, something exactly. thin and small. And yep. if you enact a whole cake instead of a slice of a cake, mm. the, part, the clients can't, they can't digest it. They can't, right? So yeah. small, oh, was it Sarah that said, no. So small, keep it small. Keep it simple, keep it small. That's why I like to say, can you tell her a bit about this and that? When I'm doing the linking, I might say, can you tell a bit about how when you hear this, you do that? Or can you tell her, can you help understand this sense of, you know, this sense of, I will never get it right. What that feels mm. like for you. Keep it simple, because if not, they will go all over the place and they'll be looking at you like, am I getting it right? They don't even know themselves. So if you lose, if you don't, if you're getting confused, slow the process down. Say, can I slow it? Can I slow it down? Can we come okay. to this piece? Because I really want her to hear about this piece. Can you help her? Yeah. Thank don't, you. That's such a good point. You're not trying to enact a cake. You're trying to enact a slice of a cake. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Elena. <laughs> Thank you. My yeah. bad. But yeah. uh, Helena, uh, I'm just wondering is how is this working with because I have a couple I'm really struggling with. Okay, okay, okay. It's okay. not about never, couple. I'm not talking yeah, about the couple. Shot, okay? Never name, never name. No, case. no, 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 no. I wouldn't talk, talk about them. But how mm -hmm. is this working with narcissistic personality? People who uh, self-absorb, who can't no. listen to anything. Mm. Now that's a whole big area. And I want to keep focused, but let me give you a simple answer because I, I want to, that's almost like a whole different thing, right? From enactment. But when you say, help me understand that, 
when you say someone that's narcissistic, do you mean they can't hear their partner or they only talk about themselves? What, what specifically is your struggle? It's, it's both. It's about uh, they are struggling, they can't see the other person struggling. It's whole person absorb, uh, personally absorbed. It's really, <laughs> it's really, really hard, right? Yeah. So if they can't hear their partner, I would assume they have not been heard. They have not had the experience of being heard and they almost feel like the only way to be heard is to keep talking, to be seen, right? And I know that's hard to deal with, but I'll try and see them and hear them. And I would, if they always bring it back to their own experience, I would have, and don't take on board their partner's experience, I would acknowledge their experience and say, and I also really want you to hear your partner right now. He or she is taking a risk and letting you in. And I really want to help you hear her because I care about your relationship and I want to help you guys have a connection. Do you think for a moment, we'll come back to this, but for a moment that you can just be with her or him and hear her and then I'll repeat the experience. But I know, Mabat, that this is a very simple, simplistic answer. But if somebody does, can't hear another person, I would assume they've not been heard enough. Not in this relationship, but just a history of not maybe being heard enough. I would try and hear them, see if I can contain them a bit. And then I would tell them that I'm on the side of their relationship and their partner's here, opening up their heart, sharing with them. And I really want to help you hear her or him because right now your partner is giving you the gift of letting you in. And I don't want you to miss that because that's so important. I want you guys to have a connection. Yeah? Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'll try it. <laughs> try it. Try it. I don't think it'll work always, but try it. Yeah? Okay. So shall I go back to the slides unless somebody else, you don't have to come on video if you don't want to. You can just make a comment or ask a question. Sarah, is there any question? Sarah, no, that... no, the question is just a lot of really affirmation for um, some of the things that you're saying about staying longer and getting deep enough and talking about slices. And mm -hmm. I love that brilliant reframe that you just had. That if, they, you know, if, they, if they can't hear the partner, assume they've not been heard. Just a lot of affirmations about those kind of things. Okay, great. Thank you. Because I'm trusting you to let me know if there's anything. I know you will let me know. And now we've got Nick in the house. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've just written a few things down from the start, Helena and everybody, that um, I just want to pull together in a summary. Mm, nice. You're going to do a move five for us, are you? <laughs> I'll be brief and quick, hopefully. Um, so first two things, when they respond, if we go back to early on in this session, to what well, I've already told them, yes. two tools that I find time and time again really 100% effective are, first of all, validation. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, of course, God, yes, I, I really understand that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. So that really helps in my experience. Mm -hmm. and the other thing is just a, a, a sort of a further expansion on what you said the stock answer which is well we sort of hear it differently mm. i actually say actually no guys what we know is that when you turn and look at each other the brain the, mm. it makes a different wiring together that's nice and that seems to work very well just sort of a, 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 you know, a little bit of scientific yes. you know validation for exactly. doing it. particularly for any anybody rational in the couple yeah. they, they love that yeah you know, nice that. and then i liked uh, the your use of the word enactments of the crux um, because it seems to me that one of the things I didn't realize for several years was they're actually probably or possibly the largest contribution to corrective emotional change. Thank you. A Not I'm only through what you, the therapist, are doing with your clients in that one occasion, mm. but what are you doing there? You're actually showing them what they are going to need mm. to do and gradually uh, be able to learn to do in their own time that's actually eventually going to lead to you and them knowing that you've completed and finished. Absolutely. And, and you then, know... Mm -hmm. And then what, you, I don't know whether you're going on to this. The area that I find a bit interesting mm -hmm. um, 
is when one of the clients, and this happens quite a lot for me, um, responds and sort of says, yes, I feel sad, but I also feel really guilty. I ought to do better. So um, I don't know whether you've planned that for this session, okay. but what do we do when the listener sort of then takes it off into the, themselves and, 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 and the speaker may, may understandably experience, oh, wait a minute. Um, they, you know, it's about you again. Enough. Yes. It's about all about you again, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think I can answer it now because when I go back to the slides, we will see whether they're already answered, right? I think what you're talking about is the yes, but experience. It's almost like, yes, I hear you, but then my view of self kicks in. And if I have a negative view of self, when I hear that you, there's something you're not happy with or something that I've done that hurt you, wronged you, I go into my negative view of self and then the partner loses you yeah. in that moment, yeah? So, it's such a good question because if you're in stage one, where, where you're trying to de-escalate the couple, you want to spend enough time with the butt and work with the butt, like, yeah, but, and, you know, tell me more. So, you know, let's, let's stay here for a moment. Process that block. What is it you're hearing? What gets in the way? Right, so when you hear this, what you... You want them to hear and see themselves, right? So when your partner says this, what you hear is, and you say to yourself, I'm getting it wrong, I'm so guilty, I, you know, I failed you, and that makes it, and this is the key thing you want them to get, and that makes it really hard for you to hear your partner just saying, I'm hurt, right? Because you go to these places of blah, 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 and it makes it so hard for you to just be with her in this moment and hear your partner taking a risk and sharing with you. You help them see how their action tendency of going into self-blame actually stops them being able to be with their partner. After all, that's what we're trying to help couples do. Be with each other, hear each other, see each other, hear each other. So that's their cycle. You want them to see it as, ah, this is what I do, and then this is the consequence for our bond. That's if you're in stage one. You want it to play back into the cycle that gets between them, right? But if you're in stage two, you've done this work. Come on, guys. Now we want to lean into the yes, the acceptance. So you can acknowledge it as in, yes, you know, there is a part of you that says blah, and I really want to stay with a part of you that says, blah, blah, blah. And that would be the, the yes part, the accepting part. I would want to expand that part. Can you say a little bit more? And you're reminding me what I wanted to say before. And this is the key thing about enactments. You've said it beautifully, Nick. The whole goal is to get to this place. All the work you're doing is to get to this place where you're helping couples talk directly with each other. But once the enactment starts, it's a chain reaction. You want it to fire off enactment after enactment after enactment. So you can then expand the yes a bit. What is it, what, what does it touch inside of you? How does it impact you to hear her hurt? The part that does hear her, tell me more. What do you hear? They tell me, can you tell her directly? That feels so important for her to hear you say this. So what, the main thing I never used to do before with enactments was, I used to treat it like, you know, one, two. You said something, I've checked in with you. Everybody's happy, let's go home. No, <laughs> that's when the enactments should start rolling from what's happening in the moment, right? You want to set up that whole chain reaction. Can you say to, can you, can you acknowledge to him that actually it's hard for me to hear because this goes on for me and I also, and then you add the and, and then the, the yes is expanded. So I think the key thing is to think, am I in stage one or am I in stage two? If I'm in stage one, I want to do the bot bit, track it, put it back in the cycle. If I'm in stage two, really your partner's now on the dance floor. Please don't leave the dance floor. And sometimes if it's guilt and shame, I will say, and you know, when you go into that guilt or shame, she loses you again, right? You're not with her. The shame and guilt takes you away. And right now, I just want you to be with her because right now she's opening up. She's letting you in. And I don't want the guilt to take you away because she's letting you in right now. Can you see, can you look at her face? She's really letting you in right now. 
because I'm now <laughs> leaning on the yes. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. Great. Does that answer a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. Let's see if the slides actually do cover uh, some of the things that have that we've been talking about. Let's see. Can you got? Can I? Can I get a yes? Can you guys see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So, how do we do this? Why is it not moving? How to set up successful enactments. We've said, don't throw them in the deep end, walk through the idea of sharing. The key thing is sharing. I've been in couple therapy, I say this so many times. Sharing is the hardest thing to do with somebody that you feel vulnerable with, that you've lost your sense of safety with. So don't throw them in the deep end, walk through the idea of sharing. Then you ask them to share. And now we've talked about, don't make it feel like a repetition. Don't make them feel like they failed a class. No. Make it feel as if there is value added. There is some new piece. There is a piece in there that's worth, that you value enough that you want them to expand it. That's how you make the, the, the request seem less like a repetition. Can you help understand a little bit more about this piece? Do you think you could share with her that, tell her a little bit more about this sadness? Right, and then the key thing is process each partner's experience of it, what it was like to tell and what it was like to hear. Don't assume that what was shared is what was received. If you see any sign of reactivity, usually it's either triggered something about themselves, view of self or view of other, or they've just not heard the message. So we really, this is where couples are struggling and our job is to lean right in and help them validate whatever reaction comes up but then process it process the block that's particularly in stage one but in stage uh, in as any time really but in particular in stage two you really want to facilitate and validate the acceptance of new responses and it doesn't mean it has to be all clean yes it's hard for you to hear this and i'm hearing that you can really hear blah 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 right keep doing the enactments for your sake as well as for the couple. Do it little and do it often. Don't give them a whole cake to eat all at once. Give them slices as you go along and finally you eat up the whole cake. And now we want to talk about this bit. Hang on, let me just check. Ah, this is it. These are the things. How do we deal with when we get people exited, when they take a detour, like, like Hazel was saying, you know, they start talking so much, it's like, a, and, and you lose your thread. Or when they escalate, one thing is sometimes you just, I think this sounds so obvious, but it's so funny, but it's sometimes you just repeat the request. Can you tell her? Yes, I know that's hard. I know that's hard. You're not used to doing this. Can you just tell her? Can you have, look at her? You can just repeat the request. Sometimes you do another walkthrough. You replay the whole thing again that you want them to, you reflect and re replay it all again. Sometimes like Sandra talked about last week, you slice it thinner, make the risk less thinner, and also less intense. That's one of the biggest changes I've, I've started doing. I used to wait, I used to want to get to like a level six or five or seven even before I would set up an enactment, something crazy like that. Now I know that actually, if I just stay somewhere, anywhere, pick up, and if I just move it into an enactment and really process it, the key thing is I spend a lot of time processing because I know that if you really process and stay somewhere long enough, something deeper will emerge. And then we talked about this just now with um, with yeah, Nick. We, we talked about this just now with Nick. Reframe any escalation in terms of their cycle. Check out what they heard. Process it. Put it back on the cycle. Blame the cycle. Come back into the moment. And the only thing we didn't talk about was catching bullets. I think bullets. Are, you know, Sandra and I spend a whole section on on catching the bullet in our trainings in our externships and so in the core skills because it's such an important thing can i just with awareness of time say the most important thing is notice that there has been a bullet notice it in the partners and also notice it in yourself because there are usually two reactions either there's a reaction immediately from the partner and if you're paying attention you will see a reaction there will be some kind of bodily response or maybe verbal response but also notice a complete non-reaction that too is a reaction to a bullet when people freeze when people say nothing when people kind of glaze over that's also a bullet just because people don't inflame and you know catch fire doesn't mean 
that there hasn't been a bullet. So notice the bullet. Also notice the impact it has on you. What is your typical response to bullet? If you are a withdrawer, you might just want to ignore it and just kind of move on swiftly. If you're a pursuer, you might want to tell the person off. I don't know, right? Or you might have a freeze response, like you want to do something, but you don't know quite what to do. It's okay. Any reaction you have is okay. We just want to acknowledge it. Maybe we're going to deal with it later, but we need to come in and save the children. You know, the first thing we want to do is save the children, save the couple. We want to acknowledge there's been a bullet. Ouch. I can see that that comment was really hurtful for you. I can see that you've been impacted by that, right? I just want to acknowledge that. Make it explicit. And then you come back to the person who fired the bullet. Because guess what? Why does a person fire a bullet? Because they perceived a threat. Yes, they look and sound very dangerous, but actually it's a reaction, it's a counterattack. So when you think of a bullet, think of somebody has just perceived a threat. And now you want to get curious. Where did that come from? What did you just hear? I noticed you got really triggered right now. What did you hear? What happened for you? What happened there? Get curious, not furious, right? Key, notice it, acknowledge it for the person who's received it, sandwich yourself between the couple, save the children, don't let the bullets fly around in the room, because if not, you're sending an implicit message that this is not a safe place to share. When I come back, I'll just check in anything else people do. I want to just have time to say, look and see if we covered some of the problems we have with enactments. I think this is a typical one, Ex therapist anxiety about doing enactments. They feel artificial. They feel contrived. It feels patronizing. I'm asking them to just say something they just said. I hope we've covered how we can make it feel less patronizing, less re repetitious, you know, all of that. And then the other one was deciding what to enact and when. And I'm almost getting to the point where I'm just thinking, if this has an attachment message in it, if this has an emotional weight on it, if this is meaning loaded with meaning, I just want to stop, drop, and stay. Stop, drop, and stay. Because I trust that if I stay long enough and if I get them to share it, something might good might happen. The other thing we talked about is people not preparing people, not introducing the idea of enactments enough so that couples find it uncomfortable and unfamiliar, right? So that was why we have to do the walkthrough. Have you ever told her? What would it be like? Can you imagine ever sharing this part with you, this part with her or him? The person says, no, right, what gets in the way? Tell me more, right? So it's almost like you process the block before you even set up the enactment. Now, I like this one, client refusing to do an enactment. Hey, what do you do? I must go back and hear what you guys do to this one. Sorry, I'm going to have to just leave this for a moment. What do you do? What happens for you when the client refuses to do an enactment? Anybody? How do you deal with that? Panic, says Mary. <laughs> Mary Claire. <laughs> Panic. Oh, no. I've done something wrong. Ah, well, Elena, um, yeah. I had a client who just point blank refused, point blank refused, you know, I could keep on like trying, but point blank refused. So what I ended up doing was sort of feeding it through me. Yeah. Um, because, he, you know, until the time that he felt that he could do it. And interestingly, later on, mm -hmm. he would actually turn himself, you know, without yeah. prompting. It, I think it was something about not feeling in control of that process, something like yeah. that. But anyway, yeah, that was what I, I love that. You know what that's called, Sarah? That's called attunement. You were attuned. Please, please, please help warning. Do not guess, get in a tussle with your clients to do an accident. That's not the point. It's supposed to be a corrective emotional experience. It's supposed to be a value added experience. If people don't want to do it, you process a bit. And if they don't want to do it, honor it. Honor their protection. There is a good reason why they don't want to do it. And guess what? I had a couple I worked with, I think for two years before he agreed to do an enactment. <laughs> so that I consider that attunement. Don't get into a tussle with, but always remember you've got the partner there. You can elicit the support of the partner. What's it like to hear that he is really struggling with 
sharing this with you. He's just taken such a big risk. You've heard it, I've heard it, but it's so hard for him to turn and look at you and share. What's it like to see him struggle with this? Ah, elicit the partner. I never knew it was so hard for you. Ah, oh, I just talk every time. Ah, I'm, you know, partners will say things like, I really, um, I'm just so grateful that you're here doing this. Mm -hmm. So don't forget you've got the partners and ally, but more importantly, do what Sarah did, attunement. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to get into a tussle with your clients and make them do anything. Respect and honor their defenses. And when they feel safe enough, it will drop. And in my case, it took two years. Can you believe it? Two years. <laughs> so thank you. And um, Jane, Jane says just what, on the chat, Jane says just what you said, explore the refusal. Exactly. Explore the refusal. Is there for a good reason. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Richard, were you going to add something? Uh, no? Okay. Hazel, were you? I respectfully smile and say how it is important for the other to hear them uh -huh. say something but i leave it at that i don't push them yeah yeah i just yeah. say it is important that yeah. they hear it uh -huh. but um, i won't push it if they don't say it or thank if they you. don't enact thank you that's yeah. attunement that's attunement thank you <laughs> and uh, and uh, greta were you going to add something or oh i can't hear you yet greta you 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 haven't muted unmuted yet Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, now yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, and now I, I'm just, I mean, it's a little bit like repeating what's been said really, but it's like staying with the client where the client is. Thank you, yeah. And, and working mm -hmm. with the, the difficulty the client's having. And maybe society get thinner as well could be yeah. very helpful at this. Yes. Thank you. And yes, stay where yeah. the client is. That's where, uh, which is a yeah. kind of sort of attunement with the client, I guess. Yeah. 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 Thank you. But, it, but kind of get in the way is my wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish to kind of move on and to get them um, yeah. sharing. But yes. So I always say follow the client, not the model. Yes. The model says I should get them to do an enactment right now. I'm going to put you in a straight jacket, EFT straight jacket, and you're going to do this enactment. No, follow the client, not the model. Mm. Right? Mm. If the client is not yet ready, don't make them do it. But like I said, get curious. Who was it that said explore the refusal? Was it Jane? Yeah. Absolutely, explore it. And also I use humor. I said, I guess it feels a bit like I'm bossing you around. Mm. Or I even joined them. I know it does feel a bit like, you know, we're doing role plays. I know it just feels weird, doesn't it? So basically, I join them in their defense, yeah, which can be disarming, right? I say now, I know a bit, a bit like we're doing that our role play thing, isn't it? Right? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, it's a bit awkward, isn't it? It's quite awkward. Yeah, yeah. And then I leave it. I don't pursue it. But I really want to address what Mary Claire said, panic, because I have to own the first time a client did that, the word that went through my head was, oh, shit. Right? And actually, I would just say, pause, <laughs> breathe. You might do any of the things. Let me go back to the share. We've talked about some of the things we can do, but let, let me go back to the share. The other thing you can do is just go back. Like we said, oh, hang on a minute. Why is it not going back? repeat the request in a different way slice it thinner walk through but whatever you do don't tussle with the client you may advocate for enactments you might talk do what nick said talk about the scientific reason for it you might advocate for enactments in different ways you may even go back to what your goal of EFT is to help them have these safe connections where they can really turn to each other and share or well, don't tussle with the client now, I think the other, I like this other problem, and this problem is knowing the task and following through. My biggest thing is that sometimes like a chicken brain, I set up an enactment, the client starts talking about all sorts, and I forget what I set up, what it was I was trying to get them to enact. And, I'm, and whatever they're enacting is not meaningful enough, but, but, but I'm just sort of lost. And if that happens, just step in. 
interrupt the process, refocus everyone, go back to the last emotion of peace and start from there. The other one was receiving, receive and not taking in and responding to what has been said. I think we've talked about that. We've just talked about what, what, it, what, what you do in different stages. The last one is drifting off at the end of the enactment. And I think that's so crucial. So now I'm going to, this was the end of it. And I'm just going to come back and say, let me come back to move four and five. Of, you want couples to know they just did something great. You just took a risk. You shared this. You heard this. You said this. You want to really summarize and reflect what just happened because it is it. This is the solution. I can't emphasize enough. The healing is in the conversation. It doesn't mean matter. They've had a moment of contact. You're on the way. Yes, you haven't quite got to the end of the journey, but summarize what just happened. Was it Sandra that said there is no, what did you say last time, last week about slicing it thinner? It's never wrong or it's never too thin. I don't know what she said, but it was something important. The fact is they've had contact. We want to celebrate it. We want to actually acknowledge that they've done something new, something different, something deeper. So that's it for me and enactments. Before we finish, does anybody want to give us some observations, some comment, some goodbye? Yay, Sarah. Just to say what a great um, kind of breaking down of it all to echo Suzanne earlier on. I think that sometimes enactments feel like a big mystery and a big, a, a big thing, you know, mm -hmm. where, where I think you've broken it down beautifully so that we, could, we know that, that it's within our kind of capabilities. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, Sandra's joined us. <laughs> I've been here all the time. <laughs> yes, but you haven't been felt. I haven't felt you. You know what Richard was saying? I didn't feel you. Now I can feel you. <laughs> I think you've, you've expressed it all so beautifully. And I think, you know, that, that kind of warm reframing so that you can catch whatever kind of happens and reframe mm -hmm. it and make sense of it and validate it is you know, just so core. And I think that, that you know, the fluid way in which you've expressed yourself today has re will really support people to, to mm -hmm. hold that adaptiveness more easily mm -hmm. around, um, you know, enactments not just being simply, you ask, they do. Yes. <laughs> you have to kind of flow around that more. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so nice. That's my co-trainer there. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to say anything? I think we're nearly up to the minute or the hour, but if anybody wants to say something or... There's a, quite a, a, a lot of lovely comments in the, in the chat. Mike mm. saying thanks, it was really helpful. Suzanne, another brilliant session, so much learning. Jane, oh, you've great. really sliced it thin. Helena, inspiring. And Isabel, as Sandra said last week, slicing it thinner is not less. Oh, less. yes, slicing it thinner. I was mm. trying to remember what Sandra said. Slicing it thinner is not less. And Mavat, are you joining to say something? Pooja, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. And I just want to say thank you to all of you. Sandra, Sarah, and I have loved this so much. We're thinking of, we have a plan up our sleeve. We're still thinking what we're going to do when the pandemonium, pandemonium, sorry, pandemic is over. <laughs> <laughs> yes because we don't quite want to let go of you guys completely we felt like we feel so connected to our community and don't forget next week sarah's got the beautiful chapter on markers and we're gonna have a we're gonna go through that hi lauren <laughs> bye bye everyone bye thank bye. you so much oh, bye veronica <laughs> bye bye it was really good bye. really good bye. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fantastic